Okay, the class officially begins. It's being recorded at this point. Um, this is what we're going to do today, the protocol. Start out, every student gives one of the one of the comments that they made before class, right? I always ask you to come with three reactions. I just want each of you to mention one of those reactions. Then I will summarize the paper. Um, your remarks can be on anything, any of the outlines or papers. Then I will summarize the paper. Then I will put you into groups. Um, and again, you pick out the points you want to talk about in uh, from that paper. Then I'll bring you all back in and we'll go through the outline on Mill, Mill's argument for equality of women, equality based on the sexes. And then I'll, and I want you to write down your favorite arguments there. Then we'll do race and then we'll do sexual orientation. And then I'll put you back into groups again and you have to speak, you know, say which arguments stood out in your mind. And then uh, if we still have time, I'll ask each of you to say what you think you're going to write as your takeaway from this class that you might put in your worldview and why. All right. So let's start out with I'll call on everybody to say at least one of their comments. If you can say all three of them quickly, that's fine, but at least one. So Samantha, what you got? Hi, Professor. I actually was jumping on real quick. I don't know if you got my email, but there was a crash on the highway. So I was late to class. And currently right now, Wilson's dorm is on fire. The laundry room um, caught on fire. I guess there was lint. And so I'm currently sitting in my car, just getting back to campus, and my phone's about to die. It's at 2%. And so I did read over the thing, and I was specifically looking at, um, give me one quick second, let me pull up the document. I found something specifically interesting before I have to, my, kind of have to jump off. Thanks. And it was talking about um, specifically the kind of biblical and like moral justification for um, basically the rejection of women's rights throughout history. And I just found that very interesting how different religious leaders throughout time went about that and took specific parts and picked things out without viewing things in the full context. But that's my one comment. I'm probably going to disappear in like two seconds because my phone's at 1%. <laughs> okay. One point about, remember Euthyphro? Yes. Is something true because the gods say so, or do the gods say so because it's true? Mm -hmm. this, uh, this argument is definitely, you could figure out by using your reason that God would want women to have equal rights, right? Yes. You don't yes. have to go comb through the Bible or the Quran, right? Does that make sense, mm -hmm. Samantha? Yes. And that's what a philosopher, those philosophers, they would do that. But it doesn't reject religion altogether. It just insists that they be integrated. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Samantha. Sorry, Professor. Well, you did your best. You gave I know. it, a, you gave it your Heraclean try. Yeah, and I'm really hoping that um, the dorm isn't damaged. Uh, so what a life we have. Oh, well, but you're starting to compete with some of the AUW students for craziness. Yeah, this has been one weird day. I, that's all I got to say. Okay, we'll see you. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Okay, Thomas, what do you got? Well, for me, um, while I was kind of reading through the outlines and reading through the papers, the one thing that kind of stood out to me is something I've been thinking about what kind of, a, and correct me if I'm butchering her name, what uh, Mary Wollstonecraft, is, I'm sorry, is that how you say it? Uh, she was talking about kind of her views on what women should kind of think about in terms of time religion to, you know, women's rights. 
And she was talking about how women's modesty should be based on rationality and not manipulation. And that kind of got me thinking, and my comment or kind of question is, when we assume that religion is kind of inserted into society and inserted into like almost our norms, you know, where does that begin and where does that end? If religion dictates or manipulates what women are allowed to wear or allowed to think or anybody, where, where do we draw the line at? Because obviously most societies, or at least functioning, well-functioning societies, we kind of separate church and state, but then we also allow church to you know, start these norms and start these ideas that almost force and manipulate women or other you know, minorities into acting or behaving a certain way. So I just wanted to kind of get people's thoughts on that later. Good. You can go back to the article about the virtue of an educated voter, right? That capacity for practical reasoning, and then we are going to read chapters from a book about how the religions have gotten used to justify. But um, you can write your final paper on this, or you can write your paper on it. Obviously, it's controversial. I'm not going to give you an, an answer, right? Does that make sense, Thomas? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, and the Supreme Court right now is making different decisions than the Supreme Court used to make. And so, yeah, it's very controversial for lots of reasons, good and bad, whatever. It's just up for grabs. And you can make your own arguments about where you think the country should go. Um, okay, Rossi, go ahead. Hey, Dr. Peck. Um, so I want to make a quick note about um, Mill when he states that, so he says that liberty is allowing a person to pursue their interests, but Buddhism, it's also talking about liberation and freedom too, but for Buddhism, it's a liberation from suffering, ignorance, selfishness, and the continued rebirth. Buddhism um, wants its followers to reach nirvana, and that's where all the suffering ends. So I think that Mill and um, Buddhism would have like a contrasting viewpoint because Mill uh, wants the people to pursue their dreams. That doesn't necessarily mean that they care about people around them. So all that they care about is reaching that end goal. So it can mean hurting other people or being greedy all along the way, but that's not what Buddhism asks you to do. So Buddhism cares about the journey along the way also, like they care about whether you are being kind or compassionate along the way to reach your end goal. And for Buddhism, the end goal is to reach Nirvana. And so I feel like that contrasting viewpoint makes me support um, Buddhism more than Mel because I feel like people should live for the moment even though we all have an end goal but we should also make an impact and like leave behind a positive impact through the journey that we walked in so that's my take on it okay can you also understand how these different philosophies have shaped the culture a lot I, I yes I do Okay, that's, that's one of my main points, philosophy matters, even if people aren't aware of it. Mm -hmm. Somebody who's in charge has a philosophy that has completely infiltrated the social norms and institutions. So that's, yeah, okay. Um, Blaine. Hello. Hello. Um, yeah, I just found it um, specifically about the the one about the UN. I have it pulled up. Uh, it was like the yeah the United Nations Capabilities Model, I believe, and it's just like um, isn't that like their list of human rights and like this is what every human should have. Um, I found it interesting, like that, like obviously all of them, they're they're good. Like we, we need those things, and like they made a lot of good points. I just found that it was a little interesting that um, none or, or almost none of them uh, talked about uh, mental health. Um, mm -hmm. And like with, with our previous readings and with like just science in general, we do know that like 
uh, mental health has like physical, like you can see it, you can see a physical change and it's like visible there. And I think our readings before have shown that. And there is one of the points talking about uh, physical health, but there isn't anything outlining mental health. So I just thought that was a little interesting. Very good. Good point. Um, Giovanni. Um, so what I did, I wasn't able to read all of the the one from the notes, but I started looking into, into like the topics for the second paper. And I don't know if you want me to talk about that. Okay. Um, okay, yeah. So it the the topics it, it asked to like talk about like leaders such as like Jesus, uh, and it kind of compared like Jesus and like Martin Luther King and Socrates and all of these people. And I thought that was interesting. Like that that was kind of like on my mind about the class because it like gives you a chance to talk about different people. I would say like on different levels, I would say, because like you can talk about Martin Luther King. He was just uh, a regular human, right? But then you can talk about like your other leaders, whether if you're if you're Hindu, you can talk about your Hindu leaders. If you're Muslim, you can talk about Allah. And if you're Christian, you can talk about God, you know? And I feel like it, it gives you a, a chance to express, I guess, what these people mean to you. And I thought that stood out to me, yeah. Yep, that's the structure of the class. Um, it's called humanist Christianity, humanist Confucianism, right? It's a humanist branch of each of these religions. Um, unfortunately, we had a, I thought we had a great discussion of this last class with just the lion students and yeah. i forgot to, and i forgot to record it uh, i got you uh, that's too bad but anyway giovanni so is that what you're taking off of the, the last class yeah okay well for all the students the students who are buddhist or hindu or muslim that that is where we're going to go um, and then those of you who are secular, we're going to go there um, in uh, next, a week from today. We will talk about secular humanism, well, even in the next class. And then there are big conflicts between humanism and anti-humanism. So I'm presenting it to you now as if, oh, yeah, this is pretty obvious. Uh, but in another week, uh, you're going to realize that a lot of people get taught that these are incompatible. And then I want you to wrestle with that. I think it's not just in America, it's all over the world. And your particular generation, especially, should wrestle with those questions. Um, does that make sense to you, Giovanni? That yeah. Because, yeah, because everything's gotten so global, we really, yeah, yeah. yeah. okay, good. Um, okay, Alexis is going to type something. Um, I re okay, here she goes. I really like the argument for women becoming more virtuous via education and not having that opportunity makes them worse Christians and more prone to condemnation. It really shows that not educating women was all about controlling them instead of letting them focus on house duties or whatever else the men of the time found was a woman's place, right? Okay, so Alexis, I think it's a really interesting argument also that if you deny women uh, reason, you're denying them the power to keep their desires in check, and you're basically condemning them to eternal damnation <laughs> on your own set of assumptions, right? And so, um, so it's an incoherent argument. And so that would be an argument for Christians to think women have equal reasoning. Well, therefore, they have to have all the other rights, right? 
that make sense, Alexis? Yes, okay. So where it usually, as soon as people bring in religion, instantly the stereotype is, uh-oh, no more women's equality. And long ago, right, 150 plus years ago, Martha uh, Wilson, Mary Wilson Traff was arguing the exact opposite. So good for her. <laughs> okay, Aiden, what do you have? Hey, Dr. Peck, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, I want to talk about the importance of free and open discuss discussion okay. uh, from the outline. Just how, um, like, sexuality used to be very uh, not talked about because it was assumed that everyone was heterosexual and anything else was just awful. But now, in today's world, we can talk about it a lot more open and uh, free, and how obviously that's a good thing. We should be able to talk about it openly. Um, but then there's also things that we can't talk about now, like back then, obviously, um, like racism was something they were open to and they were okay with. And now um, we don't talk about that, which is also a good thing because it shows improvement. But um, I wanna talk about the danger of cancel culture because there are things, obviously not racism, but there are things that we should always be able to be free and open to discuss. But if we're canceling everything, then it's just not a good thing. Yeah, Aiden, you know, I don't even know what they're talking about. I was, there's some articles that I was reading and I, I, it's like, there's only so much I'm going to try to worry about. Would you say that given what you know of the way I teach, would you say I'm prone to that stuff or I'm just on a, I think I'm on a different wavelength, but I'm not sure. What do you think? Uh, I think what you recommend us read is, is good. I, I like what we read. I, I think it, it's helpful to the class. I really, yeah. I don't think you contribute to like. Okay. You know. I mean, I do teach in this very remote place. I don't have to keep up with latest scholarship. Um, so I just feel like there's a lot of other fish I want to fry <laughs> and I don't want to go there. So I absolutely don't even know what's going on. Um, if somebody does know and they want me to read something, you know, they have some little six page thing or something, I probably ought to know, but um, yeah, we can, if it's right, if it's on students' minds, I ought to know about it. Um, but I don't at the moment. Um, Nahida, what would you like? What did you find? Are you there? Okay. Jeez, the AUW students seem to have disappeared, right? There are eight, nine of them in the class, and we have two. So um, does anybody know? Is it raining in Bangladesh or something? Um, I did look in the chat, like the main group chat, since like a few days ago, there's been like an electricity cut in Bangladesh, and it is raining like pretty badly. So I okay. think that might be the reason. All right. I mean, I generally... Uh, okay, Nahida, what were you saying? Yeah, go ahead, Nahida. I was calling on you. I think she might be talking, but we can't hear her because she asked whether we can hear her or not. Oh, okay. All I saw was where she said me. Um, can you hear me? Okay, I didn't see the. No, we can't hear you, Nahida. Um, do you want to type something in then? Uh, all right. Uh, Destiny. Greetings. Hello. Um, is the static thing acting up again or can you hear me? 
You're good. Cool. Um, so uh, I thought it was really odd that um, Mary Wollstonecraft's um, argument really revolved around control, whether it be that um, women were being controlled by not allowing them to develop their powers of reason or that women should be allowed to develop their powers of reason so that they can control themselves. Right? Okay. Rather than um, liberating themselves as you would expect. Um, for her Mom, religious can you hear me? Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, just a sec. Let's finish with Destiny and then, yeah, I just heard you. I'll make it quick. So her religious argument she thinks that to be virtuous, you have to use reason to control yourself. Um, in terms of family life, an impulsive mother will mold children that are impulsive. She thought that um, by nature, people were impulsive and needed to control themselves. Um, I don't know if she thought that specifically about women, if that was some internalized myth mis oh my God, misogyny about um, the emotionalism of females or something. Um, yeah, I just, I, I thought that was a really strange um, pain to view it through. All right, that's, that's what I got. No, this is very good. It's a main point. I think she is trying to argue against the men. So she's thinking about her audience because they're always saying original sin right? This is Christianity. You're born wanting to do wrong because it's wrong. And that's why you have to have, you know, you have to have faith, you have to have reason. Uh, but that isn't necessarily what she might even think. It's right. just, it does seem like she might be making a lot of um, concessions so that she can level with them. But um, right. Yeah. She's There's, saying on uh, your grounds, right? you are contradicting yourself apart from what I might think or not think. Does that make sense, Destiny? Yeah, yeah. So that's a great point though. That's a wonderful overall point because Aristotle says by nature, virtue is natural and it makes us happy. Whereas the doctrine of original sin says by nature, we wanna do what's wrong and virtue is unpleasant. So we always feel guilty because we don't, you know, we can't do what we really want to do. We have to have this threat of divine reward and punishment. Um, so that is a big issue for you. And that, that'll come up big time in the next week when we talk about humanism. What is it that's natural? And then what kind of a society do you structure to develop human capabilities? And um, yeah, because if people by nature are irrational, you need a more authoritarian society, right, Destiny? It's, it's a matter of control. And you might not even mind having a more authoritarian society because you have to have that kind of authoritarianism over your own desires. But if you're a humanist, you would emphasize we need to cultivate people's natural capabilities. And if you teach them so that they start using their reason, they will get it that it's a more a wonderful life to actually love somebody for their soul and not lust and actually, you know, encourage your children, that's what Aristotle said, to take pleasure in nobility, noble actions. So that's the real training of the psyche to teach your, you, to, to uh, habituate your child to take pleasure in being good. Um, so all of you can wrestle with that question. Are we by nature wanting to do what's bad? So we have to have authority or can we be raised 
to really take pleasure in what's good. And then we can internalize the stuff and we can run a society where we encourage each other. Okay, and it's a matter of degree and all that sort of stuff, but it's it's a big question. Um, all right, Nahida, um, is that does that make sense to you, Destiny? Is that related to what you're? Yeah. yeah okay. That was a huge deal for me when I was in college. <laughs> I'm a preacher's kid, you know. Okay, so. Uh, Nahida, what would you like to say? Uh, yes, ma'am. So I agree with Rousey. She said that, yes, a philosophy uh, helps us to mold our culture. So what uh, we know is uh, from the reading secular humanism and anti-humanism, uh, so far we have read. So through the philosophers, we are getting the different thinking. So uh, it uh, it helps uh, helping us to mold our uh, mold the way we are thinking, and it also uh, determines our behavior. For example, we are thinking about humanist. We are thinking about moral issues. How to be a humanist and how to think about uh, the social. Uh, um, injustice or other uh, facts. So what I think uh, we are to understand through our uh, traditional functions, uh, through the traditional function of philosophy, uh, we are understanding to foster the deeper reflection on the concept, method and issues so that are affecting on our society. So we're, we are trying to recreate those things. That's the um, result or success of the philosophy, I think so. Okay, Nahida, here's another thing, you know, in developing countries, the traditional views are that women have to stay home. And the reason they have to do all that stuff is because you couldn't possibly let people decide for themselves about their sexual lives. Or, you know, there just has to be all this order. And if you let women out into the world, there's going to be all this promiscuity and all this decline of the family and all this stuff and but right and and so if the feminist movement is that going to create all this degenerate culture is that actually going to enable women to flourish which you know they've never been allowed to do so yeah. it actually is a better culture does that make sense to you nahida Yes, ma'am. This is all about us, how you're uh, behaving or how you're accepting. Uh, because uh, our social uh, uh, social barriers are making omens, uh, this kind of, to fall in this trap. Actually, we can recreate it. Uh, so we, we need to study. Actually, education change anything. I, I believe so. Good. Well, your second paper is going to be about all this kind of stuff. So, um, you know, you can start forming your thesis. Um, now, if you read the section, I hope you didn't read the posts on humanism and anti-humanism, because that's for a week from now. You just have to scroll down a little further. Um, but anyway, so uh, Untari, what about you? Um, what we're doing is you just give, um, oh, there's a thunderstorm. Can you talk or not? Do you want to just type in your answer? There you are. Okay, you could, if you could turn it up a little. I'm just asking students to give one comment after they're reading what they, what their reaction was. Um, a rather than a reaction, I have some questions, Professor. Okay. Um, in the introduction, it said that about the differences between Trump and his and his follower and this in this version of Christian in the US. Between who? Uh between this uh between Trump and his follower. Okay, I think version. you read the wrong thing. You needed to oh, scroll wait. down. We had John Stuart Mill for today. So you do oh. have to look at the date. Um, wait, wait, okay, let me check for a second, Professor. I'm sorry. So I also even put an announcement saying, please remember to scroll down because I actually got 
during midterm. I just got ahead a couple of weeks just so it'd be organized. And also so you know everything that comes for the next paper. Um, so I'm sorry about that, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't remember having a whole lot about Trump and his followers, but I guess I'll, you know, I don't, I don't quite remember that. Um, it's not a major issue in my mind. Um, so we'll check on that later. So Shanaz, did you have a reaction for the reading today? Okay, Poonam, do you have a reaction to the reading today? No. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is talk a little bit about the paper and I definitely want everyone to be ready to go into a breakout group and have something to say, okay? Everybody has to say something in the breakout group um, because I, I just think students talk more openly and freely when they don't have the professor there. And I talk too much anyway, um, but you, you have to engage, right? You can't, don't just sit there. <laughs> Sometimes I find that and, you know, it's kind of hard because I do just about everything I can to get students engaged. And um, okay, so let me just talk about this for a minute. Um, all right, so especially those of you at AUW, the United Nations is very involved in development. And so you should be able to have an opinion about whether this is a good philosophy for development and also whether the UN actually, what you know of what they do, that they are trying to do this, um, are they living up to their goals? Now, the reason um, this is important is because we have a tradition called human rights. And I, you know, I can teach, I've taught for decades the foundation but that's, that's an abstract concept. I mean, it's something people use. Like I have a right to education. Well, okay, <laughs> it's just so abstract. So this one is more concrete. So when every year or two, when the UN looks at each country to find out if they're distributing their resources in a way that, that's just, they don't talk about rights. They talk about who's getting fed, right? Who's getting access to birth control? Who's getting access to, you know, how is rape and sexual assault? How many cases have there been? What's actually going on? And that's the data, right? The data is about what's actually going on with people and their lives. And so, the, the word capabilities, they're capable of this by nature, are they getting it? Are they able to actualize that? Is to me a more, a better description of what's actually going on. Um, but I think most of you just use the word rights and that's what you mean. But anyway, so, uh, you know, that you have a capability of life, you have a right to life, you have a capability of health, reproductive health. This is very important. I'm reading a book by Melinda Gates about um, women, what she's doing for women. And having access to birth control is number one in a woman's life to control the whole rest of her life. Her life is completely affected by when she gets married and when she has kids and how many and how far apart. 
And so that's what she said is they've got to get access to birth control. Um, so that gets to be controversial. And um, in the United States, sometimes uh, there's controversies where we won't give money to organizations that are too focused on reproductive health rather than other things. Um, all right, then there's bodily integrity, being uh, sexual assault, all that sort of stuff. This one is senses, imagination, and thought. Um, and, oh, and destiny. I think maybe this might have having a free mind, right? Not let somebody can't control your life and your thoughts. Does that make sense, destiny? That this one is more humanistic. It just says we naturally seek this kind of fulfillment. We aren't naturally always trying to be mean and evil and naughty. <laughs> okay, emotions, we naturally love each other. Um, we don't naturally, you know, harm each other, whatever. And then my main thesis in this paper is that practical wisdom looks like it's very esoteric form a conception of the good. Like most people are just trying to eat, you know? They're not forming some conception of the good. They're not sitting around and philosophers with too much time on their hands. And what I'm arguing is that underneath all of it, there is an idea of women's nature, men's nature, and the good life. And that is controlling everything that women actually confront day to day. Um, let's see, uh, then there's the one with other species. This has become a, a big deal as the climate gets worse and worse. The UN has, I think the world's preeminent um, organization or collection of scientists that come out every few years with, the, with a statement about what's going on with the global climate. It's, I think, the most respected report. And there was one that came out recently and it's bad news. <laughs> um, the, the capability of playing. And this one, another point I really wanna make that's important is that being able to participate in political life and then material, being able to hold prop property. So what happens is the globalization process is actually 180 degrees from this, right? It starts out being driven by money, right? It's about economics. It's about people making money. And then, oh, but that's tied to rights or whatever. Um, so I do want you to think about that. But um, just, just reflect on it. What does that mean that the UN has one set of priorities and the globalization process tends to be exactly the reverse? Um, so how do we juggle these? I don't think there's any you know, silver bullet answer. I think if you just put money first, you're gonna get a lot of unnecessary human suffering. But if you just put everything but money <laughs> first, that might, that might not be the best way to go either, but it is what it is. Um, all right, so let's see. The UN has a, a concept of the good life. And I know, you know, I know a lot of students from developing countries and some of them have good things to say about the UN and some don't. I really think it varies a lot. Um, how, that, I mean, it's so multi-dimensional that it's, I, I don't think it's wise to either have an entirely positive or an entirely negative view. But I do think um, in the US newspapers, it's, the UN's effort to prevent war, like the war in Iraq, the wars um, in 
um, Iran, Yemen, they, they tend to have, it's very difficult for the UN to prevent some of those wars. Um, the Security Council is not able lots of times to take care of things. But just because it, it isn't the number one player in the, the wars that the US is in or more prominent wars, doesn't mean it doesn't make a huge contribution. So there are many wars around the world. And so the UN's um, work in African countries, et cetera. So each one just needs to be evaluated. And then the other thing the UN does, UNICEF, uh, promoting children's well being, women's well being, in general, promoting capabilities. But also the UN has a UNESCO has a um, international uh, cultural sites and natural sites. So some of the world's most wonderful cultural and natural sites are in poor countries that don't have money to maintain them. And so the UN goes in there and uh, maintains them. I know that there's a couple of them in Greece, or there's a number of them in Greece, because Greece isn't that wealthy a country. So the world historical sites of Delphi and Olympia, for example, but there's there's um, the one in Cambodia, the, oh, the very famous temple. Anyway, I think the UN does. Cool the, one. Yes, um, does a lot of good work. So if, if any of you want to write your paper and do a little more research on the UN, that would be great. Um, let's see, when rulers think women or based on race are incapable of the highest levels of humanity, then they deny them education and that leads to all the other problems. So she gives an argument based on religion. She gives an argument based on reason. And um, if you do need reason to save your soul, um, you need education. And so, um, it doesn't make any sense to say women don't have reason because they're, they're, you know, it's not a very just God that would condemn women to eternal damnation. So women, that's an argument that women do have reason and every society that's denied them education and access to all aspects of society is unjust. Um, this starts with childhood habits. So her argument also recognizes the power of social conditioning, except every time a little girl is born, she can figure out that she's not stupider than the boys. So you cannot rewire human nature, no matter how much your culture tries to get women to believe they're inferior, they, and many of them do and they accept it, but it never lasts because it's false and, and the truth will come out. So it's better to set up your society based on what's true. No matter how complicated that is, no matter how far we have to go compared to where we are, it, in the end, justice and truth and virtue need to win out so that people are able to be fully human. Um, so you'd be a better parent, you'd have a better marriage, um, you'd be a better citizen, and you wouldn't get duped by religious false prophets, you wouldn't get duped by political um, manipulation. Um, the arguments are the same as they used to be, I don't know if you if that struck you at all that these arguments are old. They, you know, she wrote this a long time ago, but um, it's still a lot of it is true today. And um, and then India uh, News Found talks about the importance of theory just for straightening things out, right? So theory 
in the way I'm teaching it in this class, right? Aristotle's virtues. It's a theory, but it helps you sort out your life. It's not intended to replace life. It's just intended to help you understand that when you confront a situation and instead of just getting frustrated or, you know, you can just figure out, oh, this is that type of problem. And so every human being has run into this type of problem. And these are the types of mistakes people make. And so you can put yourself on this level of humanity and realize that, okay, I'm gonna try to be one of the people that makes the better decisions rather than the worst decisions. But I know that now I can really learn from these theories because I can recognize that my life, my particular life has been, you know, is engaged at these different levels that are described in theories. Um, the double standard about modesty. So you, you all could talk about that in your groups, especially the students from AUW might have things to say that the students from Lyon might have a different experience, but I think they'd really be interested in that. Um, you could talk about the headscarf, what your opinion about the headscarf is. I myself um, am open to a lot of different opinions. I don't have any one opinion about headscarves. Um, mostly, I just don't like the way men use women and how they dress or what their bodies look like. I mean, why is that so important? That's what annoys me. <laughs> I mean, we don't talk about men and whether they wear headscarves or not, or whether they, you know, wear whatever. It's, I don't like the way women's clothing and women's in general gets uh, a lot more emphasis than it really should get because you should be worried about their minds, not what they're wearing today. Um, all right. Uh, the laws, okay? So then you could talk about laws in your country. Your countries might have good laws, but they're not enforced. And that's a big problem throughout the world. It's called you have the rights du jour according to the law, but you don't have them de facto as a matter of fact. So a girl in a, in a rural village, for example, might actually have the legal right not to accept a, an organized marriage, right? And, you know, her dad can't make her marry this guy. But is she ever, is she going to actually, you know, exercise that right? First of all, she doesn't know she has it. Second of all, she would be ostracized from her village and she would, she doesn't have any other options. Third of all, she might get beaten or hurt. I mean, it's one thing, that's why you have capabilities instead of rights, right? She has the right, it's right in the constitution. Well, she doesn't have the capability to do it and that matters. Um, religious laws, yeah. And um, Martha Nussbaum, obviously I think you could talk about that in your small groups, is that, is there a gap? And there was in India, and I think there is also, I think there is in Indonesia where there is the constitution and then there are religious laws related to family and all that, but they can't violate the constitution. It's just that um, it can get sketchy and most women aren't gonna go and you know demand their constitutional rights. So, I think it is a problem in a lot of um, developing countries, but I also think it's important that night that Nussbaum does not reject religion, right? And she doesn't think that all religion is sexist. There are plenty of feminists who do. And if any of you wanna write a paper that says I'm a feminist and I hate religion, 
and you give your 50 reasons, um, if, if you have a good argument, like you can argue anything you want. This, this class is about you having a free mind. It's just, I make an effort to, to overcome stereotypes. Like I'm not a Western feminist who's gonna trash religion, right? I, I'm going to leave it open and say, look, um, religion doesn't have to be sexist. Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad, uh, Socrates, basically were not. They were way ahead of their time. Um, all right. So I do want to put you in groups then. And you, you know, hopefully you've taken a few notes and you have things to say to each other. And I, you know, I don't want to intervene, right? I want you to enjoy talking to each other. That was main point of the class. So I'll pause this. Oh my gosh, I really thought I had done it, but nope. Thanks, Untari. So the, the function of an intellectual, I think, is to provide vision that doesn't reject the past. It doesn't try to blow up the past, but it doesn't revert back to nostalgic view of the past. It it gives arguments. What can we learn from the past? What were the mistakes we made that we don't want to make again? We can learn the mistakes. And what were the good things in the past that we want to imitate and apply to our own situation? So when John Stuart Mill wrote this, his the people, most people just absolutely couldn't get it. Women had been treated as unequal forever. And so it was extremely radical. It was extremely threatening. It would completely change everything about their lives. And so it might look non-controversial to us, but remember in his day, it was extremely controversial. So uh, why is it difficult to prove? So you have to, again, think about this. The preponderance of feeling, learn the lesson of not basing your opinions on feeling, right? The conflict between feelings and what's actually true. The influence of social institutions, habit and custom and prejudice. Learn the lesson, don't base your worldview on these things. People are unwilling to re-examine, learn the lesson. Be willing to re-examine, like Socrates said. Um, why is it that mill people who want change have to make an argument when in every other respect, freedom and equality tend to be assumed to be true? Oh, for white men, <laughs> wait a sec, wait a sec. You know, why do you have to argue for being more inclusive about equality and freedom. It's hard to prove a negative. It's hard to prove that everything we're doing is wrong. That's why he has to create this vision or this argument. We romanticize, right? Oh, instinct, you know, women, je ne sais quoi, there's something mysterious about them. No, they're not like men, they're special, <laughs> which means, they shouldn't get their hands dirty with politics and economics and all that stuff. <laughs> Naturalism, what's natural? We don't know what's natural. And religion, you know, that's not tied to reason can just about say anything. And in his day, there wasn't a lot of research, psychological, social science research. And so this is the school of thought that has led to all of that social science research, outcomes-based planning. Why is it important to speak out? Well, it's never been tested. It's just might makes right. Nothing else has ever been tried. Um, scientists, you know, any sort of enlightenment, enlightened approach to culture is not gonna be based on that. It's going to have to start from scratch and justify itself. Um, 
What about women accept male domination? Well, first of all, not all women do. Second of all, whenever there's a, an oppressed class, they don't start out by completely uh, rebelling against everything. They actually point out, well, my husband is worse than your husband, or, you know, um, those who are un under any power never begin by complaining of the power, but of its exercise. They're afraid to complain for obvious reasons. You're going to go in public saying my husband is an SOB and then you have to go back home and sleep with him. I don't think so. <laughs> um, so Mill's conclusion is that all the causes make it highly unlikely that women would ever complain. The fact that they do complain means this, there's something highly unnatural about this. Um, the social institutions try to enslave women's minds. History is taught. There have always been false beliefs that eventually get recognized. Someone has to be the messenger. Modern societies value people as individuals. Modern economics focuses on that. Um, the importance of free and open discussion, which is what uh, Aiden brought up. Experience can't be evidence because our experience is so often molded by conditioning, which could be false, could be based on a lie. Um, women's characters are very distorted and men's characters. Very few people know their real character if they're playing out these roles that they're expected to play out. The politics are inherently contradictory. I think this is a good argument. If women are really by nature intended to be wives and mothers, why do you have all these sexist laws and customs? Just they'll do what's natural to them and they won't take on those positions. When you force them to do it, it sort of implies that actually they are equal. <laughs> so you're, it's just contradictory. Um, so marriage, given that marriage is, um, is woman's only option, it should be pleasant. The actual facts are it's very unpleasant. The laws make it very difficult for women. Family life should be based on empathy, sympathy, equality. The laws and social change, you have to change the laws um, because laws are made mostly for bad people. There are plenty of good people, but the laws have to insist that people behave appropriately and get punished if they don't. Philosophy and religion teaches self-sacrifice, but then you force women to make the most sacrifices. Okay, to see the future of the species, that's the goal of the intellectual elite. And they have to take responsibility and they, they shouldn't abuse their power. And that's for, so Aiden, when he's talking about cancel culture, and of course the rest of you probably know, but to me, um, both, on both extremes, there's a certain kind of um, illiberal, anti-intellectual use of language that undermines democracy and it undermines meaningful dialogue. And so I think that it's a very serious responsibility for intellectuals to try and move people forward without threatening, without demonizing, without degrading or humiliating anybody, without, you know, any of this stuff, just move forward to a better society. Um, all right. Then you do the same thing with race, is uh, society should be structured so race people are, there's no discrimination on the basis of race. Why was that so hard? Well, people had their feelings, their feelings contradicted what was true. There was all this habit and custom. People were not willing to change. Why should the burden of proof be on the people arguing for equality? Uh, it's difficult to prove a negative. 
There's another romantic view that God made it so the dark-skinned people would serve the white-skinned people so they could move forward or some dang thing. Religion, there's quotes from the Bible. Why is it important to speak out? Because it's only been might makes right. There was never any meaningful effort to have a racially equal, equal society to show whether it worked or not. Um, someone needs to blow the whistle. Slaves accept domination. Well, uh, usually they they don't. Not all of them do. Many of them just complain about my master is worse than your master. They're afraid to complain. Obviously, they'll get killed or beaten up or whatever. I mean, they can't complain. So it's always it's incredible that we would have a movement eventually to overthrow slavery. Um, history teaches there's always been false beliefs. Um, the importance of free and open discussion. Uh, today, you know, racism, we still have these free and open discussions. And again, they should be responsible discussions. They should be about how do we solve these problems? Uh, we, how do we move toward equality? People don't even know the characters of, now it wouldn't be slaves, it would be African-Americans, that so many people have to just kowtow to people more powerful than they, that they don't really say what they think. Um, policies are inherently contradictory. You should give everyone equal opportunity. And if they're naturally inferior, you should, it'll just play itself out. Um, under slavery, marriage was completely corrupted. Uh, family life was corrupted. Um, the laws need to be changed. And again, it's the intellectuals seeing the future of the species. We've got to get beyond this. This is really bad news. Um, then homosexuality. All right. The principle would be that people, citizens with different sexual orientation, no matter what, should not be discriminated against. It's wrong in itself, and it's a hindrance to our progress. Why is it difficult to prove? Preponderance of feelings, feelings conflict with what's reasonable. There's all this habit and custom. The burden of proof is to argue for the equality when it really should be the other way around because this is the movement of history is more and more to be more inclusive it's hard to prove a negative people don't even know who's gay and who's not uh it's romanticized that you know men and women are meant by god whatever it's naturalized romanticized and religionized right We've got all that stuff defending only heterosexuals and everything else is uh, perverted, unnatural, and it goes against God. Um, why is it important? It was never initiated. We never bothered to find out anything about non-heterosexual orientation. We haven't studied science. We don't know who they are. We have been clueless, right? Um, Nothing else has been tried. The origin was just might makes right, silencing people. Okay, they accept it. Well, they, they don't all accept it and they're afraid, right? I, I rem I'm old enough to remember when people were afraid to speak out. And I've had students who told me they would never say because their dad, they're afraid what their dad would do to them. He'd beat them up. They definitely disown them, but they might also beat them up. Um, some of them are really petrified by what their fathers would think. Um, okay, uh, homosexuals are afraid to complain. All the causes combined to make it unlikely that they were rebel. Um, but eventually history teaches that these are false beliefs. We were totally ignorant about non-heterosexual orientations. Um, that it's important to have free and open discussion. 
It's important to do the science. It's important to do the social science. It's important to get it, get it exposed and discussed. Um, very few heterosexuals know the characters of, of non-heterosexuals. They don't even know who's who, right? And I mean, I hope you all understand that a lot of these things have become revealed over the last 30 years or so. Um, policies are inherently contradictory. Is there evidence that these people are perverted? I mean, where's the data? I remember when my son had a fourth grade teacher that was not only a guy, he was gay. And I just thought, okay, you know, here we are. He's not a predator. He's not going to go preying on my son. Um, all those stereotypes. Um, let's see. So marriage, right? Why can't they get married? Why can't they make a long-term commitment? The society benefits when people make long-term sexual commitments. There's no reason to think they're incapable. Give them a chance. Um, when they're not allowed to marry, they just become more promiscuous. If, if, homo, if heterosexuals had no institution of marriage, they would be a lot more promiscuous, I think. So making that commitment, making a public commitment, stabilize society, it stabilizes people, it enables them to have a more normal life. It also gives them in our country a whole lot of benefits. 1,200 tax breaks, all sorts of other advantages to being married because this, this society has a stake in people um, having stable long-term sexual commitments. Um, okay, so children, um, okay, um, yeah, all right, there's no evidence that homosexuals can't raise children just as well as heterosexuals, um, all right, uh, philosophy, and again, the intellectuals, uh, have to see the future and have to say we're moving in this direction. Now, a huge change came when the laws changed. So not everybody changed their minds, but it did change quite a bit when the laws changed. Um, I do wanna put you in groups for about five minutes. Um, just, okay, so um, if any of you had more to say, uh, you can start next time. Next time, I will also start you out with what your reactions are. And you can bring it up if you want to bring it up. The other thing is, if you want to have it in your post or in your final worldview. Um, but I, I think personally that John Stuart Mill, I mean, it's an old book and Mary Wollstonecraft, but it, it's a genius, right? He takes scientific method. Apollonian reasoning. Usually science is based on what has happened or is happening. It's based on facts. And somehow he can use that method to make a recommendation about changing the society absolutely so that nothing is the same. So every fact is different. Um, and that's amazing to me. And in a compelling way, right? It appeals to your reason, like it's very compelling. And so I really like the fact that he did that in his time and that you can take the same arguments and that you can see these patterns in the, in the mistakes we make and then in the vision forward, we can just learn a lot about what not to do and what to do and how to use our reason um, and, and how to avoid the polarization that we have right now. I think, you know, his, his um, essay or his argument is not polarizing, but it is making, you know, a serious recommendation for significant progress, significant movement forward without, you know, threatening, criticizing, undermining creating fear. People shouldn't be afraid. They should be able to understand with their reason that we need to move forward. So 
that's the kind of thing I hope that you also write in your papers, that you'll want to be one of those intellectual types that can provide vision, give arguments, not be threatening, but be very compelling. Um, all right, then you'll be a truly liberally educated person and a great gift to the world because it sure needs it. Um, okay, so we'll see you next time. We're going to be talking about human.